but and keep in mind it's a like a it's a full-size orchestra of i don't know how many 60 or more people and this is a teeny tiny little town jacksonville oregon and so i got put with a couple that can only be described as the sweetest little alcoholics <laughs> <laughs> Yo, 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 it is your boy, Dadbot, and welcome to our sound. Today's guest, we have local oboe player, Joey Savalaggio. Thank you for coming out, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's been it's been great. We were chatting before this, and I'm just, yeah, it's stoked to have you here. So before we start, I just, if you could tell everyone a little bit about yourself and, you know, what you're doing right now. Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm from Sudbury originally, um, and um, I moved away when I was 17 to go to school and then lived away from Sudbury for... All of my academic career and then um, all of my professional career. So I moved back. My last r real gig was I, I played principal oboe in the Memphis Symphony in Tennessee for 19 years, and then I moved back here uh, about five or six years ago um, to be closer to my family. And it just was kind of lucky because it was just pre-COVID, so the whole orchestral world was kind of turned on its ear anyway. So it seemed like a really great time to be back. So that that so that's one of the reasons you're like, okay, I'll just go back and see. Well, what, yeah. You know, the th well, it's funny. I kind of, um, I fell a bit out of love with the, with my job. Um, In Memphis? Yeah. Okay. With the whole kind of culture of orchestral playing. Um, I just sort of, I, I've gone through my whole life as a person who has just been crazy. Like, I was sort of an oboe jock. Like, I would practice all day long if I could. It was never a problem. I was in love with it. And then... Um, the, I, I had a couple of physical issues and that made playing uh, a little bit more challenging, mm -hmm. and it became a bit less fun. And so I ended up coming back. Um, while I was in Memphis, I was hired on um, as a staff member as their education consultant or their education specialist, I guess is what it was called. So um, I was designing education stuff, and I started my own business where I was consulting with other orchestras to help them build um, education and outreach uh, materials. And um, when I was there, I piloted a program um, in the Soulsville neighborhood in Memphis, which is kind of an underserved. It's sort of where like Stax Records, where all like all of the kind of Memphis R and B stuff came out of in like the '60s and okay. '70s. Okay. Um, what was the, the neighborhood? Sorry, it's called the Soulsville neighborhood. The Soulsville, okay. And um, I piloted a program where I worked with kids um, to use music to have them create a story, and then I put music and the story together for them. Yeah. And um, based on that, I just actually i mean this i i i know as a disclaimer lying is wrong but when i moved to sudbury i cold called the rainbow district and said hey i've got this this um eight week residency that i do combining music and literacy i wasn't got in touch with this brilliant woman who was the, then the arts consultant for this the board uh she uh gave it the green light and then i was i've been doing that i've been doing um, versions of this this residency program where I use classical music, live classical music, to uh, inspire kids to write music, or pardon me, write stories and just kind of embrace literacy. Yeah, that's sweet, man. So this all stemmed out there. You brought that, okay, so I wanna go down that road, but before we go down that road of education, how, I wanna talk about maybe as a kid, how you got into, cause the oboe is a strange instrument to be kind of like, that's my thing. So how did you get involved with oboe? Um, Let's see. So as a kid, I just loved music. And my dad played guitar and my sisters and I sang. And so we'd spend Sunday mornings like just singing Elvis songs. And, you know, I mean, really, no one in my family was much engaged with classical music. So my greatest aspiration as a child was that one day I might be a member of the group ABBA. It was pretty much, you know, like that. It was kind of that. Right. So I thought, well, maybe you'll be like a pop musician. Um, and uh, then I picked up the recorder, and the recorder is very accessible. Yeah. Um, I, and actually, it's a totally legitimate instrument. When I bust out stuff on the recorder, kids don't get it. Like this was the instrument that was written for before the transverse flute by you know Telemann and Bach, and, like by legit composers. So okay. people think it's a toy, but it's it's not, and it's really hard to play at a very high level. I'm okay, um, and I love it. But um, so I started playing recorder, and then. I just started to play by ear the songs that we had been singing. So I just translated the little jam sessions we would have to the recorder. And then I did pick up the flute briefly and I was pretty bad at it, okay. or at least painfully ordinary. But and then it's hard. I, I find flute tough, man. It's hard, yeah. It's a tough one. Yeah. Um, and then I, I nobody played the oboe when I was that weird kid, you know, who was a little out of step and so I wanted the thing that nobody did. Right, right. Um, and I just took to it pretty quick. Um, 
I played for about a year and a half or so, and then I went to a um, a summer like a band camp on the recommendation of my 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 band teacher here at Lockerbie. So uh, you how old? Just so you know, how old were you when you started playing the oboe? About fifteen. Okay, and yeah. then the next summer he's like, you need to go and yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I went to this place, and this is like a great example of how being in the right at the, in the right place at the right time is life changing. So I went to this band camp. There was a teacher there named Laura Seifert. She had been for years the principal oboe in the Kingston Symphony. Okay. She identified some aptitude. And so we made an audition tape um, for this school where she knew the teacher in the mm -hmm. States. Um, and it's called the Interlochen Arts Academy. It's like the preeminent boarding school pretty much for the arts in the United States or was at the time. So I didn't know any music. And um, so we recorded a couple scales and maybe like a, like a couple lines of an etude. And she asked me, like, what else did I know? And I used to hold my tape recorder up to the TV and record TV show themes. And then I would learn them by ear. Oh, nice. So yeah. my, my uh, recording, my audition tape for the, at the time, the best school for the arts in the United States was two scales, a couple uh, lines of an etude, and the theme for Murder, She Wrote. Which, I mean, that's, that piano part at the end, it's... it's, it's I, I, I make to, it look easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. I have, it's been so long since I've heard it, but that's, <laughs> oh, that's cool, though. So you ended up out there, and were you you wanted to leave? You were looking to get away and go start somewhere else, do school somewhere else. Well, you know, no, not at no. the time. Okay. But so when I grew up in Sudbury, because I'm a little older than you, um, like I was in high school in the late '80s. I was growing up as like a little closet gay kid in Sudbury, Ontario, right. um, not knowing what to do with that. And then I get all of a sudden, by some miracle, I get lifted to a place where there's all of this artistic stimulation. The teaching was brilliant. I learned to love learning. The academic staff was incredible. Not that I didn't have great teachers here too, right. but like there was no one, there was no one um, uh, that t t to teach me oboe. So I get this world-renowned oboe teacher, Dan Stolper, who was just like he's had contact with so many successful students and then also like i'm in this completely liberal arts environment i remember so when i was a kid do you remember did you ever you're probably too young but the tv show fame i know of it okay yeah so there was it's a, like a school right yeah, they're all at this school it's like the new york school of performing arts and i would watch this show every week and it just seems so cool because all these really artistic kids and so i was in the cafeteria one day after having been at interlocking for maybe a month month and a half and um so at one point Somebody rolled a piano away from the wall. They had like an upright piano. Somebody starts playing it. All the dance majors started dancing. People were like playing. And this is, was just like a, an occurrence. I mean, it sounds like I'm making this up, but it just happens sometimes. Yeah. And I remember going, there was a bank of telephone booths. And I just remember calling my mom and just almost been tears, just saying, thank you so much for sending me. Like, it was so incredible. It was such a great experience. Right. And I learned a lot. And so had I not gone there, because um, I soaked things up like a sponge. Also, when you go to a school like that, like... The kids had achieved so much. They these I'd been I'd had no training before I went there. Right, and you started at fifteen. I yeah. mean, these kids were probably playing since they were kids. Yeah, like they're flute players who maybe started at four, and yeah. they, they they had to watch what kids had achieved or could achieve at my age was mind blowing, and it really helped me. Well, because you know, it, I don't think sometimes it's easy to understand that something's possible unless you've seen someone do it, mm -hmm. and as soon as you see that, you think, okay, you I know what? Too. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to do that. Yeah, that's cool. So where where was this? Or what state was this in? In Michigan. It's Michigan. right outside of Traverse City, Michigan. So it's north. Okay. Um, in Michigan, and um, yeah, really snowy, very cold, really teeny tiny campus, um, and a little isolated, but kind of on purpose, I think. Right. Beautiful part of the country, and that's awesome. um, then after that, after I I did my last two years of high school there, and then I went to Michigan State University for a year, and then on to McGill and U of T, right. and then the Royal Conservatory in Toronto. So. Um, when, at, at any point, did you think, like, I want to try other instruments, or you were just married to this? You're like, I'm an oboe player, oboist. I, well, I loved the oboe, and it, see, the oboe, a lot of things on the oboe came pretty easily to me. It's considered a difficult instrument, but mechanically, it's actually very simple, right. um, and it's, it's very similar uh, to recorder fingerings, so I had kind of a leg up. The thing that's difficult about the oboe is actually making reeds. So it's a double reed. Yeah. I have to make them myself. They're, they, they're very delicate. They change with the temperature and with the humidity. 
I wouldn't use the same reed that I would use to play a Brahms symphony as I would to play a Vivaldi concerto. You have to build specific things into the reed. For what the oct for how what you're trying to play. Well, like octave. okay, for a Brahms symphony, I would want like a darker, deeper sound. Right. For a Vivaldi, it's important that you have really crisp articulation. So you have to build certain things into the structure. And to be honest, I was never brilliant at it. Like it was always a struggle for me. So that was also part of why I think I decided ultimately to kind of put down full-time professional playing was that it was a huge time commitment and and it's very expensive right and there are all sorts of tools you can buy and i was always trying to buy myself better at reed making you know you'd hear oh this person who's great is using this knife well i mean i'd be like uh, right away ordering that knife right, right. and then still be the same oboe player i was did you learn how to make these reeds in high school or how did like right away when you started they're like oh by the way you're also making your reeds yeah i had no oh. idea I had no idea that was going to be a part of it. I've always been a big fan of the arts, not so much of the crafts. Yeah. So when I when I found that out, I was like, oh, dude. So um, my teacher in high school let me kind of slide a little bit on that. Okay. So that when I got to university, um, I was kind of behind. Um, it was my fault. Um, but And then I met, it's, this is great, actually. So when I was at Michigan State, I met a young oval player. I was in my first year. She was in her fourth year. Her name was Carrie Darton. Really amazing, amazing oval player and brilliant reed maker. That was like her great, her thing. Oh, so she had in mind that we would date. Oh. And I was like, I don't think that's going to work out. <laughs> but you can make all my, you can finish all my reads for me. So right, we yeah. ended up becoming really, really good friends. And um, she would finish my reads and she was brilliant. So I sounded like brilliant for a year. And then I, then when I got, when I left there after that year, I was left to my own devices and then it was a bit of a struggle to kind of catch up. Yeah. Um, and without a read, you can't have a successful performance without having a decent functional read. Right. That's a lot of pressure too. You're like, what if this thing isn't made right? What if I made a right. mistake or something? Yeah. But it feels like now, like when you play, I've seen you play many times and like, sounds great. Like, so you've got a handle on it now. Like. I mean, not to my, not to my satisfaction. Okay. This is the other thing. Like, so I can, I, yeah, I can make a read. I mean, like I would always say in Memphis, uh, I would, I would complain to the second oboe player, oh, I can't make reads. And she would always say, well, who's been making your reads for the last 20 years? You. So yeah, maybe you don't love them, but you're making reads. Right, right, right. So, um, I just know a lot of people who are really great read makers. Um, and it's a struggle for me. So there are aspects of my playing that I've never felt I was able to develop to my satisfaction. So you're playing, this is another thing that kind of contributes to like feeling healthy mentally in this field means that, you know, if I had a bad oboe day, I was a terrible person in my head. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if I have a bad read kind of same thing. So if you have something stressful to do and you think that the read is going to provide you with an obstacle to a really successful performance, you have to walk on stage and you have to sit there like you feel great because somebody bought a ticket to come and see you. Yeah. So there is that aspect of theater involved. And also your colleagues need to feel like you know what you're doing, that you're confident because you feed off of each other. I mean, I'm sitting this far away from a person. So they're feeding off of my, my Energy. vibe, right? Yeah. Are you in a, in a like a... Like when you're playing, would there be just you playing oboe, or are, you, are there other oboes playing with you? So in an in an orchestra in Memphis, which was a bigger, like it's a medium sized orchestra, we had I played principal, so I was in the first chair, and then there was a second oboe, um, and then there was an English horn player. She was um, English horn is just a larger oboe, it's okay. tuned a fifth lower. It's a beautiful instrument, um, and so uh, there was a woman who was, I guess, technically assistant principal oboe, so she would cover for me if I was off. And if we had the three-man section, then she would play the English horn. Okay. Um, the larger orchestras have a four-man section, like okay. Toronto. Okay. And in Memphis, um, so okay, so let, let's go back. So you yeah. were you're in Michigan because you you kind of you went to these schools and you kind of who is the like out of all these schools, I'm sure you had a lot of amazing teachers. Who is the best best teacher you've ever had? Okay, th that's kind of it's difficult to answer. The the easy answer to that is my last teacher in Toronto, whose name was Dick Dorsey. Okay. At the time, he was the um, the principal in Toronto, uh, amazing, beautiful, lyrical player. Um, I had always been, I'd always had teachers who were a little bit on the um, sadistic side. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> they we were, talked about this before. <laughs> they, they maybe weren't always, um, they, they came from a different school of playing and teaching where they had been torn down right. by their teachers and then built back up. And so the first time that I met this, this man, Dick Dorsey, he... Um, his approach was different. He was a kind and ge very gentle person, a beautiful musician who every time you heard him play, he would do something that was heart-wrenching. Um, 
And so I studied with him for my last year of, of study in Toronto. And he, um, he is pretty, there, he's one of the reasons why I decided to continue. Um, there are so many like analogies that I cannot share with you probably on your podcast about like ways he would, he would ask me to play something and he would like come up with some scenario. Actually, I can't tell any of them. I don't think I, <laughs> but, ah. Um, you can tell, you can say whatever you want, but yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, well, when I'm you're gonna, comfortable. I, I don't, okay, so I, okay, I'm going to give you a beat, and then I'm going to tell you a story, okay. and then we can decide later on. So that's coming by the Yeah, so Dick Dorsey was a fantastic teacher, a humane... But that worked, though. That worked. Yeah, it worked for me. Those analogies worked. Oh, the 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 analogies always worked. They were yeah. always great. Um, and actually, that's kind of maybe the beginning of how I started to think about m music and storytelling together because it, he would you know, ask me to sort of paint some kind of picture. Another another teacher that was really important to me. Um, it was someone who I who I only met for a very brief time. He played principal in the Vancouver Symphony. His name is Roger Cole. Okay. Completely opposite for me, almost like a football player instead of an oboe player, but beloved anywhere he went everyone loved this guy and i was i subbed for a friend of mine as his, t as his teaching assistant in courtney bc one time just for a three-week festival okay. and he um it was when i was feeling really quite down about my playing as before i had met uh, dick so this was like in your 20s like your early yeah. 20s? okay okay and so i go and i'm his teaching assistant i expected that he would would not like my playing with very different styles of playing he was so supportive and um, even though I was working there, he offered to give me free lessons, which I, of course, made use of. And I remember one time I was playing a piece um, with, uh, I was playing a piece with two of the students. That was kind of part of my job was to fill out the section, you know, because uh, oboes aren't a dime a dozen. And there was a very little tiny oboe student and she was walking down the hallway. And we were playing, we were rehearsing this piece and he was coaching us. And this young, he said to the little, this little oboe player, come in here, come in here and listen. So I heard him as we're playing. I hear him say to her, "Look at watch, watch Joey's fingers, watch what he's doing," and and he said, "That's what you need. That's what that's what you have to do." Right there. Yeah. And I was like, "Okay, wait, wait, wait a second. Like this guy is saying that I'm okay and I'm not feeling okay. This is the thing about music, though. It's that it's so easy to turn this sort of mirror, this negative focus yeah. on what you can't do, and like because you said it earlier, if when you talked about how we're, you're, the feedback is always. Here's what you can fix, not what you can do well. Right. Yeah. Well, like another, I mean, I hope I don't sound like I'm being too horn tooty, but like another really remarkable experience I had, I played a master class once for the principal oboe player in the New York Philharmonic. He came to Toronto when I was at the con, Joe Robinson, amazing guy. Um, and he, so we played, and uh, I played another movement of this, this piece um, by Benjamin Britten. It was the movement from the six uh, metamorphoses after Abed. And there's a really, really fast part. And so I played in one of the, it was like a slow chunk, a fast chunk and a slow chunk. So, and his job was on stage in front of the, this public audience was to critique you and to give you comments. Okay. So terrifying, right? Yeah. So he gave me a couple of ideas about how to pace some of the original phrases and they were great ideas. Then he gets to this part, the fast part, and he said, well, this, I've, I've never heard that played better. And then he just moves on. And so in my little head, it's, I'm exploding. Like, cause yeah. like, you can't tell that to me. So afterwards, he gave us all a lesson, and he, um, so I have, I have, and had, always had, I've always had, a, uh, a, I don't know if I'd say a unique approach to oboe playing, but I've always had strong opinions, and often I have been counseled, these are not, don't do what you're doing, it's not traditional, people don't expect that from an oboe, they don't want that from an oboe. As far as the technique or what? Sound. Okay. Uh, the use of vibrato, so like the, you know, the wave that goes through the sound like you hear in singing. Yeah. Um, and, but I was, I was, I really stuck to my guns because I just felt really strongly that this is what I wanted to sound like. Right. So one of the things I, I do is I try to experiment with different colors in different ranges and I've always liked my high range. Right. Um, and so it's been easier to experiment in that, in that area. So one of the things I like to do, you can hear this in singers, very rarely in opera singers. Sometimes they will flatten out the quality of the sound on purpose, so that the the barrenness or the just the barrenness or emptiness of the sound gives you a place from which to grow and open up, and then you kind of blossom into something that has more life. Right, right, right. But that life, the juxtaposition between where you start and where you finish, 
to me has always been fascinating. So I'm playing, I'm in, I had a private lesson with this guy and I'm, I'm playing in my high range on his read. He gives me one of his reads that he just used for a New York Phil concert to play. So I'm playing it, feeling super self-conscious, yeah. and I played a note, a quiet note on the high range, and he stopped me and he said, How, what are you doing? And I just assumed he was criticizing me because we're very much accustomed to receiving criticism. Right, right. And I said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, that's just like, that's a thing I do. He said, no, I want you to show me how to do that. I was like, what? Whoa. How are you asking me to tell you that? Like, so as, as a result of having been, I can look, and it's not like I was ever the best oboe player in the world, but I did have strengths, you know, so... But you go through your, a course of, of time where you're being taught by people who are really focusing on what's negative. Whenever you get this kind of kernel of something positive from a person you respect, it, it's a little, it's like mind blowing. It, it, yeah, yeah, and it's tough to kind of receive it because you're like, whoa, whoa like, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and, and like, but what I find really fascinating is that like, you're in your, you're playing the way you want to play. It's a unique way that's unique to you, and he wanted that nugget he's like i want that kernel like to, as a musician myself i'd be like holy crap what i do is important to you it was you yeah care? It, it's it's well and the other thing too is that keep in mind that most professional musicians not all and certainly not all teachers but people i think when they get an instrument so you know what i always say like putting an instrument in somebody's hand it's like driving a tap into a maple tree except that instead of getting like syrup you just get like total like ill-adjusted create all your crazy comes out right? Right, right so a lot of musicians can't admit that they're not perfect or that they well again there's this theater you're not you're told not to tell people what you can't do yeah. so many people it's for like for a musician of that caliber to it to say to me i'd like to do what you're doing i can't I'm, now do it I can't that's an do, exceptional yeah. That's an exceptional person yeah. who's able to say to a student, I recognize this and your playing is exceptional. Oh, you know, and a great and a wonderful thing to receive. So do you put that at the forefront when you're having those days where you're like, I suck? Do you pull that out and be like, yeah, I remember that time? Like, I have a mental file folder. Yeah, yeah. When I feel like I generally suck. Yeah. Um, then this file folder has now, um, it includes other things outside of oboe, but for, for sure, for a while. One of the things I used to do, my friend Jennifer taught me, she used to pretend that she was our teacher. And because she said she would get on stage if she was really nervous, she would pretend that she was our teacher. And she, she kind of cited because like, he, he doesn't really have human emotions and so like you know didn't your didn't your alien leaders teach you that before they sent you here like humans have emotions but she she said that if she posed as someone that she felt was more competent than her it worked and that she was generally more relaxed she would just pretend to be a version of her that was more like a person that teacher, she but... yeah my my other the other nerve like there's another nerve thing that i love talking about when i was in memphis when I got there, the principal bassoon player, her name was Layla Zamora, one of the most unique and lovable people in the world, beautiful player. Um, there's a, a piece called, by Stravinsky called The Rite of Spring, which starts with a really high note on the bassoon. And she would always say, she was from Costa Rica, um, she had a very, very thick accent, which I loved, but she would tell me that she thought she would always crack, that she was going to crack that note. Right. She was always afraid. The bassoon starts the whole piece by themselves and on a really high note. And so what she told me, and I do this, Still to this day, I recommend it to anyone who's a performer. So she said that when she has those misgivings before she's going to play, she calls that the gnomes coming. And okay. when the gnomes come, they say, you're going to mess it up. You're going to mess it up. So her ploy was to distract the gnomes. So right when she was about to play, she would say to the gnomes, look at the monkey. And when she would, oh, there's a monkey. And when, and so, and when she would, and the gnomes would look and she would start while they were distracted. I know it sounds ridiculous. But it's like you're taking that part of your mind subconsciously, yeah. like put it yeah. over there. So I can monkey. do my job. Yeah, and, and she said it works. I've tried it. It works, actually. Yeah, eh? Yeah. I'm going to keep it in mind because I'm always worried about the gnomes, man. Uh, There's always little notes where I'm like, oh, this part of the song, I'm going to mess it <laughs> up. That's cool, man. And that, I think that's a big part of the musicianship that we don't talk about is the, the self-doubt. Like, it, and we, and like I, I see players like you who are just so proficient on their instrument. I'm like, God damn, they're so fucking good. How's he so fucking good? But it's. <laughs> It's, it's kind of nice to hear, not that it's nice, but it's nice to hear another musician say, like, no, I experience it too. We all do. Yeah. And to think that someone so great is saying, oh, we're, I'm going to pretend there's gnomes to help me get my mind off this <laughs> doubt, you know? like. Well, I, th I think it's it's normal. I mean, we all per suffer performance anxiety, I mean, on stage. I mean, and, and like, look, I mean, it's, it's funny how transferable these skills are because really in life, I mean, when you're walking around, you have to interact with someone. There are performance elements there. Yeah. And you want, I mean, not that we're, we walk through life 
I, I, I go through life wanting to be authentic and want, I want people, you know, I want to be myself, but we are, we sometimes are in circumstances where people need to either believe us or they need to trust that we know what we're doing. Right. And th those are really transferable skills. Like when I was 18, I, if I were 18 today, I would be on every drug for social anxiety available. I could barely talk to people. At that time, really? When I was a kid, people thought that I, when I went to university, people thought that I was Italian from Italy, that I didn't speak English. Oh, wow. Um, because I didn't talk to people. Um, I was very shy. It was very difficult for me. And so music is another thing. I know I'm jumping all over here. No, but, no, this is great, man. But this... like, like having been involved in music, um, trained that out of me to an aspect to an, to an extent like i remember when i first got memphis when you get a job in the states you get this huge stamp of approval from the canadian music community right for some reason right it's so, like they look and they think like this guy's made it like that's yeah. a big jump so <laughs> i got well, my first year i got um i got a, a, i've been working with this this well i guess a composer had sent something to a producer at cbc so i got asked to do like an hour long national broadcast at Glen Gould. And so I come back to Canada after working in this new job, which was terrifying to me when I was in Memphis. It was a big step up. Did and, you get this? I'm going to jump uh, to that. So how'd you end up with that job in Memphis? Oh, <clears throat> well, so, okay, let me just, so I, I got a job out of school playing second oboe in English horn in Thunder Bay. Okay. Um, I love that. I love living in Thunder Bay. The hall was beautiful. The orchestra was amazing. The people were beautiful. I still have lots of friends from there. Then after only a year, I got principal in Windsor so I had been playing second so getting a job playing first or principal also closer to Toronto it just seemed like I should take it right, right. and so I went there and I loved it great city it was fun it was a really fun city to live in again lovely orchestra beautiful people and then um, I had friends in Memphis and their principal oboe position came open I didn't want it Oh. Um, I didn't want to go because I liked my job, but I knew again that it was a step up, and that's kind of what you have to do in, in music if you want to you make your life. Yeah. yeah, so I auditioned. I was so determined that I wasn't going to win it that um, I had a friend who worked at U of T, and he booked me for a week of office work in like during registration. The audition was at the end of August. I used all the money I had to get there, okay. um, and then so and no one was more surprised than me that I got it. Um, so auditioning. It, it, I guess it, it kind of bears mentioning. So you go to an audition, and it's kind of like an American Idol situation, but not nearly as glamorous. Okay. Uh, with more ugly people. And so... <laughs> <laughs> and so um, you... Well, not ugly, just out of shape. I hear you. So, it's American, so let's be honest. So, <laughs> be well, no, but I just mean musicians generally. It's oh, we're, yeah. We're okay. not a pretty... <laughs> that's what we're very difficult to ensure, really, because of okay. like how many health issues like musicians have. Right. Uh, oh, so, wow. Anyway, um, so I go to this audition, and so you go, and there's a huge holding room. You are at the first round audition. There might be between 40 and 80 people there wanting that job. You all have a prescribed number of things you have to play behind a screen. Um, you are encouraged not to wear shoes that might um, uh, give away your gender. Um, oh, wow. It's like, yeah, because there are, there there, of course, like every field, there were biases for quite a long time in music um, right, right, right. With, uh, concerning gender um, and race. So um, blind audition, uh, so you play. They tell you if all of your hard work, you work for maybe two, three months to get ready, plus you spend money on a hotel and a, and a train ticket. Yeah. After five minutes, they tell you if that has all been for naught. And then, so I, I, I do my first round, I moved on to the next round. The next round, I don't remember how many people, I think there were only three, because they had two days of first of preliminary auditions. That's how many people were at this audition. Wow, that's wild. And I was on the Was they from all over the world? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. So, um, so then I got to the second round, there were three of us, I think. Um, then one guy got knocked out, um, and then there was me and a young woman, and they made us do four final rounds. So I got there at eight in the morning and I didn't leave till 10. My head was hurt, everything on me hurt by the time. Yeah. It's a stressful thing all day long. So uh, you play and so we played our fourth final round um, and I finally said to her, I, I don't think, they clearly don't know who they want. Right. I said, I think she was, uh, she was wearing a dress. So I made a joke and I said, it's probably gonna come down to who has on the nicest dress. And she gave me the best response. She said, you know, I almost wore pants, <laughs> which I thought was so cool. And yeah. So anyway, shockingly, they gave it to me. The reason why they were struggling so much was that the conductor at the time, his father had played in the Cleveland Orchestra, and Cleveland had a very specific kind of oboe sound. Um, so there are like lots of different styles, and Cleveland was a, like it's a definite style. 
she had studied with the guy in Cleveland. So they loved her sound. They loved everything about how she played excerpts. Um, but when it came down to it, they, they, they had a slight, um, they slightly liked my style of musicality better. Right. Um, you think it part of it was your, that uniqueness we talked about with the vibrato, those things, maybe they were like, there's attitude there. There's something. I think, well, I think actually that frightened them. Oh, really? Yeah. Because they didn't think when you don't, when there's an unknown, this is why it's not a great, why it's not considered to be great to like try to deviate from what people are looking for. Right. You have to fit into a section. And they have expectations of what that section will sound like. So there's oboes, flutes, clarinets, and bassoons. And you have to have a sound that's going to work. So the risk of having a sound that's a little bit off the beaten track is that people don't know. They don't. It turns out it worked. I mean, the conductor met with me for my first tenure review and told me that he was happy with how, it was, how my sound fit, but he wasn't sure. He had, right. he, he had misgivings. But, you, but through all those people, they were like, we're going to take a chance on this. Hmm? That's crazy. Okay, so now you're there. You do a year, and you said you ended up on um, the the Glenn Gould Theater. Oh yeah, you so were doing a, a show there. Yeah, so I got um, a producer from the C from CBC, Keith Horner, called me. Um, he's a really good, fantastic guy, and he booked me to do um, a recital, and um, at Glenn Gould, and then I started getting a bunch of CBC work. So then I the next year I did one in Ottawa, and then I came back to Toronto, and then I did something in Winnipeg. It was really exciting. It was a really exciting so, time. Um, how old are you at this point? Thirty. Wow, so, sweet. um, and so this is again, like related to social anxiety. So I was supposed to plan, I think a 50 minute program and I was supposed to get a piece for oboe and strings arranged for oboe and piano, but dumbass that I was, I didn't do it. I left it too late and then I didn't have time. He was not pleased. Right. And so he said, well, I guess we'll fill the five minutes with an interview. And I remember the sensation of just sweat dripping down the back of my neck at the at just the proposition that I would be standing on stage talking in front of an audience, yeah. talking to a national audience. For TV or for radio? Radio. Oh, yeah, I have gosh. a great face for radio. <laughs> so I... Uh, no, well, yeah, I yeah, for sure. I'm, yeah. So um, anyway, it went really well. And the thing is, is that instead of getting up and delivering anything academic, I just got up and talked like me. And turns out that works from the stage. And so it became kind of a thing. But in having done so and having been forced to do that, um, I had to get more comfortable with speaking from the stage. Right. And so now it's my favorite thing to do. Um, wow. And so like in, in like a chamber music setting, with it, if it's just like a small group, it's, um, it's, I love to be able to talk to the audience. And you know, it's funny because I feel like it me makes them more forgiving if I make a mistake. Oh, well, look, it's little Joey. He's like my friend. They have that connection with you. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's I didn't think about that, but that's true, because you become they're not just another you're not just another person on the stage. You're right. someone that I've had that moment with. Well, and think about like yeah. orchestras; they seem kind of stuffy. Everyone's maybe in a tuxedo. You're on a big stage. You're in a, like a, a grand hall. People yeah. don't even know that they don't have to dress up to go to an orchestra concert. People have asked me, friends of mine, well, what should I wear? Wear what you're wearing. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Um, if anyone's judging you for what you're wearing to an orchestra concert, then they're at the orchestra concert for the wrong reason. Right, right, right. Um, so, uh, but it's nice to be able to have that contact. And, um, like, I did something here with the quartet from the symphony, which was really a pleasure. You know, Sudbury has incredibly talented musicians. Um, the, well, I mean, so, you know, we know each other from the, the work that I've done at the library. And um, the two violinists that I use, and then that, and the cellist, yeah. so Christina and Beth and Dick Van Yeah, who yeah, are amazing. And Maggie, like, amazing musicians yeah. in town. And um, it's such a pleasure to, and, and one thing that I love too is that, like, I feel kind of like I'm a part of this little cool kid group of musicians now. Like, I get to do, um, like, sort of some Francophone community stuff, and I get to do, um, like, I've done some Yes Theater things, and it's pretty oh, much nice. all because I've fallen in with this, I've been embraced in the short time I've been here by this, this group of unbelievably talented musicians who are just, uh, generous and Open kind. And yeah. It's such a great community. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's good for you, man. So you did, okay. Sorry. I don't want to get off topic, but you said SDC or well, yes, theater. Mm -hmm. Were you a part of, are you part of Chicago or no, 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 I've only done, I've only, only been able to, my schedule has only allowed for me to do one thing. I did Joseph and the amazing technicolor green coat. Okay. Now I'm, I, I'm not a huge fan of musicals, but it was really, it, but they're fun to play. Oh, for sure. Um, I can imagine. You know, and, yeah. um, and it was really, it was really cool. And that, I mean, that organization, like they, you walk into that building and everyone wants to be there. It is the most amazing 
uh, community and they're so positive and so creative. It's no wonder they're doing so great. I mean, Alessandro is amazing. Uh, they're all amazing. I, I, I love Ali. I actually taught him. Not a lot of people. I didn't tell a lot of people, but I taught him as a as a student as a student teacher. My first year in university, I went there while in teachers college. I went to St. Charles, and he played the um, the marimba. That's so cool. And I was like, this is a, this kid's a good player. And then I just watched him grow into like who he is now. Who's like he's like this theater mogul, and he's mm -hmm. done so many great things. And like, I went in there too to film something with my buddy Richard Barlow, and the energy in there is positive. There's no. It doesn't feel like there's. It feels like a really welcoming place. Yeah, to be in it there. really is. I mean, when I walked in to get my music, I, I felt like everyone was just so friendly. And, and again, just their vibe, their whole rehearsal style, everything is, I mean, it's very, I mean, obviously they, they rehearse professional like hardcore. Yeah. But, um, but no, I would, everyone, everyone loves, everyone in town loves working there. That's cool. Yeah, man, I'd love to do something there. I'm, I'm not at that point yet there, but it'd be cool to collab with them at some point. Um, okay, so I want to go back to, if you don't mind, going back to Memphis. So mm -hmm. you were there, for, you said 19 years. Mm -hmm. So, like, tell me some stories about Memphis or, like, the experience you had there. Because 19 years, that's a lifetime yeah. to, to do that for that long. Um, that's the longest place I've ever lived, actually. Yeah. Uh, it was very it was very weird. Um, it was, so when I first got there, it felt like a bit of a different place than the place I left. Okay. Um, they felt really exotic when I got there. The weather, of course, is it's so much warmer. There's virtually no winter. There's a little bit of winter, but not compared to here. Um, I met a lot of amazing people. The orchestra is um, pretty international. I mean, any orchestra, the people who are playing that orchestra are not typically from the community. Not very many. Okay. Because people, because it's so competitive, and so you know, people are coming from all over, and so I met a lot of people from, um, well, like some Canadians were there, um, some people from like off the continent um uh, it was interesting um without making it sound too negative at least when i got there it felt a little bit like dialing it back to the 50s there was still some there are still um present racial tensions okay when i got there i right. don't i i'm i'm my hope is that things are changing um because I was in this, and again, I don't mean to make it sound like a bad place. Um, it's just that the American South is very different from any other place I'd lived. Right. And I kind of would forget sometimes because I was in this isolated little arts bubble with my friends from Boston and Hungary and Costa Rica right, and right, Canada. Right. And so um, and so it was, it was easy to forget sometimes. Uh, there's ex the other thing that I realized that I'd never seen before I got there was that city, <clears throat> there's this juxtaposition of extreme wealth to extreme poverty. So I was living when I first got there on a very middle class kind of street. On the other side, uh, like on, on the two streets over, palatial, like mansion type places. The, the next street, like behind me, garbage bags nailed into the windows. Holy crap. Yeah, it was, um, it was sh shocking for like this, some little small town, northern, yeah, kid, you know? yeah. Going into that, how many people live in Memphis? Like, how many? What's the point? Oh, it's, you know? oh, it's over a million, I think. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, like the there's there are suburbs now, like um, and so I think they calculate the, the entire population with Memphis, and then there's a, a German town is a is a, um, is a suburb. There's some some suburbs. There was um, well, I mean, without, so, Memphis was the was where um Dr. King was assassinated. Okay. And at the Lorraine Motel, and there there is a civil rights museum that's built around that. What sort of what I've been told, one theory is that when that happened, Memphis kind of shut down. Um, it's right on the Mississippi. Should should be a great like you know for trade and stuff. Right. Um, but um, Nashville really boomed. I think people were afraid of Memphis after that. I think that it it, it just the stigma of that having happened was oh, something that was very difficult for people to reconcile. Um, okay. I, and so, I mean, I'm, I won't pretend to know any of the real reasons. It just seems like to me having an event like that occur in your city is devastating. Yeah. It's traumatic to everybody there. Yeah. 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 And when did that happen? I mean, you, when did you go to Memphis? What oh, I didn't get there until 2000. 2000. And then Dr. King died in, was that the sixties? Yeah. That's a long time for it to still be like, it's well, still raw, I guess. You know, you know, it's funny. I worked in Ireland two years and. Um, people advised me, you know, don't talk about politics. 
I was in Northern Ireland. So pardon me. If you, I, I did say no, Ireland to someone, and they got offended because I said Ireland, not Northern Ireland. Oh. They still sort of speak of the troubles in in um in sort of whispered tones, like you don't talk about things political with someone you don't know. Really? Yeah. It was, oh. it was um, they were. It was kind of interesting that it sort of there were it's two sides of a different of a two different sides of the same coin, I guess. But there are elements that were similar between oh, the two places. Idea. I mean, Ireland is a beautiful place. I'm getting so way off track. No, it's cool though. Okay, but okay, so now I'm wondering how you how you got out to Ireland. You said two years in Ireland. Yeah, well, just I went two times. Um, so when I started writing kids shows, <clears throat> I I did a I did a performance of a show that I wrote about the planets, okay. and it has a mnemonic in it to remember the order of the planets from the sun. Okay. That I wrote into it because I couldn't remember the order of the planets from the sun. Right, right, right. And so. Um, I did this at, with um, a group called the New Ballet Ensemble in Memphis, and they gave me a dancer, and the dancer kind of took the audience through some some exercises with the music. It was very cool. But um, the founders of this festival in, in Northern Ireland, the Wald City Music Festival, were in the audience with their kids, and they liked it. So they commissioned me to write. Uh, two years in a row, they commissioned me to write um, an outreach program, and then they invited me um, and my partner Todd to come he's an actor, to go uh, to Ireland and to do a week-long tour. Of, uh, yeah, it was, it was so cool. It was, yeah. It's a, such an amazing place. And, and at this point, like the, the orchestra in Memphis, they're like, yeah, go ahead. Like, you get like a sabbatical or some sort of leave that they're allowing? Well, it was, they're only short-term residencies, and it was outside everything. I would, I would, so the season in Memphis lasted from September to the end of May. Okay. And then so you're cut loose for the summer. Um, people, you, I think musicians can apply for unemployment, as a Canadian citizen living there, working on a visa, it was not an option for me. Okay. Um, I crammed my summers as full as I as I could of other work because, um, so like I I think I told you I taught at a w eight week summer music camp in at the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee for years. Right. I, I another festival in Arkansas, the um, Hop Springs Music Festival, um, for a time, and then I for fifteen years I worked. Um, I played principal oboe in this orchestra, a three-week orchestra festival in Oregon, in Jacksonville, Oregon, okay. which was one of, like, it's a highlight of my career. Yeah, okay, you seen that. I saw you light up when you mentioned it. So what was so great about that experience? Um, it, was, for, it was kind of agonizing because you, um, you, um, it's, you have to play outside. It was at an altitude level that I didn't, that I was unfamiliar with or un, it was, I wasn't used to. Oh, okay. So making yeah. reads was really hard. Um, what kept me going back was, first of all, they played amazing music. There were amazing soloists that came to work with the orchestra. Um, the people in the orchestra were unbelievable. Um, and, um, yeah, they, they, I, I just love the people in that orchestra. And then, so every musician was housed with a family, a host family. Now, normally that wouldn't really be my thing. Right. But, and keep in mind, it's a, like a, it's a, full-size orchestra of I don't know how many 60 or more people and this is a teeny tiny little town Jacksonville Oregon and so I got put with a couple that can only be described as the sweetest little alcoholics <laughs> <laughs> I love them I love them and um, I, I won't I won't state their name but I do I love them and we, we still are in contact um, I consider them to be like a part of my family and um, so it was a really rigor rigorous schedule. So we would, I, I wish I could tell more stories about, about my home life there, but we, um, it was a really tough schedule. So I would have maybe two days off in the three weeks, maybe three. Okay. So I would give them one of those days just to get me completely. <laughs> just have a good time. Obliterated. Yeah. Yeah. Just let's just and, party. Yeah. And, 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 um, they were so they're, they are kind. They were, they were, um, like I said, retired and just really beautiful people. And they loved supporting the orchestra they loved Sweet. i would come home after rehearsals or concerts and we would talk you know over several drinks about you know uh, all the what happened backstage and why did this happen and you're like you a know, rock star to them well it kind of felt like it you know yeah. um and that uh, and, and they were just they're like i said um they're two people who have made my life inestimably better that's sweet do you and so you keep in contact with them yeah i owe them a call it's been a little while but yeah that's cool man the, the connections i kept thinking like you're telling me about how you went from this school to that school and it's like as musicians we're looking for that community because mm -hmm. like you said like we 
we think differently as musicians. Maybe we don't fit in with everyone. And like, I just see your, your journey of how you went from, you found this community and everywhere you went, you were able to find these communities of people that like, they kind of feed you. They, they fill your cup in a way, you know? I, I'm, I am more fortunate than most, I think, in that <clears throat> I have, um, there have been so many remarkable people who've been put in my path, not just in music, um, but but a lot of them musicians for sure. And um, one of one of the things that I aspire to do though is I'm that person who doesn't let you escape. Like oh. I will, I I maintain contact with people, um, and so if someone pops into my head, I just give them a call. Right, right, um, right. And so I I call the principal of in the Thunder Bay Symphony. I mean, I haven't I played there more than 20 years ago I 20 maybe 30 years ago um I'd love to keep in touch with her I have friends that I that I am in contact with from university um in fact you know as a matter of fact in Sudbury all of the friends I made in high school were just pretty much whoever was within like hitting distance in the band right okay well right. those people have grown into remarkable adults I mean moving back here um and sort of kind of picking up and we were always in contact but picking up like you know having actual relationships with them with them again yeah after that amazing amazing that's sweet are they musicians still um no no way no it's funny how there's some people that you see them and they're so good and then they just well uh, but i mean it goes back to why being why studying music is so important especially when you're young like it teaches you things i'm i'm a much smarter person than i would otherwise have been because of yeah yeah like i know how to I, you know it teaches you to meet short-term goals and how to make long-term goals, how to focus, how to multitask, um, you know, concentration. Um, it's, it's so great for your head. Yeah. And there's like a patience that comes with it too, obviously, because you're trying to practice and get better. And like you say, hit those goals and, but it's like a meticulous patience. Like this tone is off, you know, it kind of makes right. you more like hyper, I don't know, like hyper, um, perceptive on well, certain things. How kind are you to yourself when you're playing? Oh, <laughs> Not very, not very. I, I'm a typical musician. I just vlog myself after everything yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. And it now, does that get easier and better? How does, how do you get rid of that feeling? Cause like, I, like you said, you're probably not there yet, but you're getting there. Well, you know, to be quite honest, um, I feel like that, well, with me, it was never going to go away. Okay. That's part of, that was also part of what I kind of grew tired of, um, was never, cause you know, Having so I did play this past year. I played principal with the symphony. I was one of their like two contracted members, and then I built built their education stuff for the library system, and um, and it was fun. I mean, I met some really great people. But it reminded me because I had, I you know during COVID when when I left Memphis in like nineteen oh wait, sorry two thousand nineteen. That's okay. Um, I didn't I didn't really play very much. There was a period of about three four years where I didn't play very much, and I realized that there were some things I missed, but um. But that, the um, self-criticism and the, um, yeah, that flogging, I don't, I don't miss it. And so this year when I was playing, I was determined to make it into a more fun and social thing um, and to enjoy the people around me and to just try to play. Yeah. Uh, it, but it's hard. It's too hard when you've been, when you spend as long as I have being so clinical about playing, it's almost impossible to just say, okay, now I'm going to treat it like it's a hobby. Right, right, right. Almost, that's like that freedom feels like you can't have that freedom now almost I guess yeah and yeah. Or allow yourself to almost well and it, it's and I won't even say that it sucks the fun out of it because there's a different kind of fun from being you know super focused and like but you know the thing is I can count on one hand how many times I've been on stage and a phrase came out of my instrument exactly the way I wanted it to right in in 30 plus years that's not enough times yeah but, the, but, but you're so good. That's the thing. Like you are coming from, like, I've seen you play and like, you're incredible, <laughs> but to think, but just to hear that, like you're hearing it from me, but you're like, in your mind, you're like, well, there's all this stuff you're not aware of Eric. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. And it just, it's crazy how it's like the only hobby is it. It's not a hobby. It's more than a hobby. It's like a calling, but it's the only thing where you're just like, you're never fucking good enough. Yeah. No matter how good you are, you're always like, I suck at this. Well, you know, it, well, it's true. And like, um, and I don't want to, so I'm, the, the oboe is still a very important part of my life and, and now we, I'm kind of shifting towards using music for more, like for teaching more um, and just for kind of youth development more. Right. Um, but I will say that like um, the oboe, I'm really happy, I'm glad that I had my career. Um, 
I, it was it it was a great a great way to spend that that portion of my life. Um, I think that at this point I've come to understand that having the elbow in my hand too much is actually an impediment to me experiencing the most joy that I can because there are too many negative things that come with it. Right. So relegating it to a to a smaller section or of my or like sector of my life yeah. it for me is what I need now. Um, of course, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be, a, but it doesn't define me any longer. Like you, I mean, you can tell me how, the, how if this makes sense to you. So, if anyone asked me what I was, or if anyone described me, the first thing that they would say is, "Oh, he's an oboe player." Right. Um, and, and you so, would say that about yourself too. Oh yeah, first thing, okay. I'm an oboe player. Um, I used to. So it's funny. I used to actually walk if I would meet someone who I would date. I would walk them through at the front end and say, just so you know, you will always be number two. The oboe is always number one. If I don't have enough time to spend with the oboe, if you make me feel like I don't have enough time, my time with you will be less pleasant. Right. So let's just, and people, people were okay with that. I mean, well, you're I, being honest, which is great. Right. Well, like, and I'm pretty fantastic. So I mean, like well, they, now they're all fighting with you. Exactly. Like, you know, hey man, sorry. Right. I, I belong mean, to the oboe. Imagine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, it, it's so, it was, it was so, so defining that, um, that it, it really did eclipse a lot of other things. And so that was great. I did that. I loved doing it. It was what I wanted to do. I was happy to make the sacrifice. Uh, okay, here's another very personal thing that I'm saying on a podcast. So I was in therapy for a little while. Um, I recommend it to everybody. Yeah. And so when we were discussing like issues of self-value or, you know, or like let's say self-hatred, it's, that's very intense to say that word. But um, when my therapist said, well, okay, what do we do about that? I said, oh, no, no, we'll just hardwire around that because that's part of what makes my oboe playing nice. So let's just leave my self-hatred where it is. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he and he was skeptical. <laughs> but how messed up is that? It's I get it, though. You know? You're like, there's, a, there's something there that helps me that I can't eliminate. Yeah. Because it makes me a better musician. It makes me feel it differently. I can't... Right. I get that, man. Well, and... You know, there's, there's. I, I hope that I've, I, I've always aspired to this, and not aspired to this so much as it's become, it's been a, um, a goal. Certain instruments or certain people, instrumentalists, whether it be a vocal, whatever they're doing, instruments, there are certain to me. I hear certain kinds of sounds produced that actually can. This makes maybe no sense, but they contain more emotional content. There are certain quality, certain sounds I hear people play, or sing, and I, I hear. Just the feeling behind yeah. it. And yeah. And so I, that was always a thing that I want. That's why I kind of wanted to play with color and, and change how I sound. And because I, I, I wanted to be able to speak. Right. And I wanted to say things through the instrument. Right. I think that when I listen to recordings of myself, I can hear the aspiration. I can hear. I can actually sometimes hear it. Um, not always. You have to be like circumstances have to be right. right. But right. it was always a concern. It was always a goal. Um, and so. I would have done. I would have done anything I had to. Like I, I had a really, really bad. Um, my tonsils were infected when I was in Memphis, and my doctor said I should have them out. And I said, "Will that change the cavity?" Oh yeah. And he said, "Yeah, it'll change it." So I said, "No, no, no. I'll just leave them because I don't want to change the way my oval playing right. sounds." So, so they're that, still there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. It sucks getting them out older now, so don't yeah. get them out now. Yeah, I don't Apparently think. it's terrible. I'll leave it. Yeah. But that's wild, though, but I can understand it. I got my water here. I can understand that whole thing of, like, I have... I don't want to change what I'm doing. I'm, I've figured myself out. I have my process or whatever it might be. Mm. And like, but the, the, when you said, this is hardwired in, let's build around that. <laughs> that, that, boy, that makes a lot of sense, though. Yeah. Anyway, but, sorry. I, you just caught me there. I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Well, it, it's... I don't know. It, it's... I think, like I said... Everyone thinks that, um, so many people have said to me, well, you don't have a job, you play. I'm like, no, no, no. Cause like there are so many hours of making reads and practicing like very, very, not mind numbing. I love the process of practicing. I would do an hour and a half of scales every day to start off in, wow. diff in all my major and minor, all in different, like in thirds and different articulations. And, um, cause you know, when I was a kid, nobody made me do anything. So I guess because I kind of coasted on my aptitude for a while and then, like for a long while. And then I got to the university, the university of Toronto and in one of my first lessons with my first teacher there, he asked me to play like a D flat major scale or something. I didn't know how to do that. No one had ever asked me to play a scale before right. because I have very fast fingers. Um, and so I, technique wasn't an issue, 
Well, scales don't have to do with technique. Scales have to do with everything about your playing. Right. And I was so mortified that I spent every practice session from between that day and today um, doing an hour and a half scales. And I, I learned them by ear, So I, because I thought I didn't look, read them from paper. I wanted to just kind of have a more organic sense of, of how to produce them and what the intervals meant and blah, blah. Yeah. And, um, and my playing changed. It was like the biggest, maybe the biggest... Um, period of improvement I about in about six months I could might sounded like a different person because you're taking on scales and how long do you practice for every you practice every day well n not right now okay not right you now, were I guess back then yeah well yeah. I mean and every day uh, you practice if you take a day off you'd feel guilty right. um, but so if I was practicing on a regular schedule so if I had a rehearsal that day if, if I had a two and a half hour rehearsal I would do about four hours of practice and then maybe two more hours of remaking and then if sometimes I would have two, two and a half um, hour rehearsals. So I would probably do about just three hours in the morning. Right. Um, and then um, if I was getting ready for something big, like um, like a big, like for like say something like on the radio, yeah, yeah. it's not unusual to spend eight hours a day for about six weeks. That's how I would do it. Whoa. So, so it's, you know, it's funny. Here's another kind of weird like piece of luck. So I went to a wedding in Richmond, Virginia when I was in Memphis <laughs> and my friend Carrie Darton, who was my who finished my reads at oh, Michigan yeah. State, right, right. was living close by. I was looking for a new oboe, so I went. She picked me up, and we went to wherever it was. And uh, there was this woman named Sharon Lindquist, and she had an oboe dealership, which I think people think it's funny. My oboe dealer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I um, I was just getting ready for this first really stressful thing I had for the CBC, and I um, so I went with my friend into this woman's basement and I played about 15 oboes all by the same maker, the same maker I still play today, Loray oboes, they're, they're made out of Paris and a really fine instrument. Um, and so I found one I liked and I said, well, I'd like this one. And so she said, Hey, you know, um, you sound good. Um, I'm, there's this thing called the international convention of the double read society which is just as boring as it sounds. It's kind of like a Star Trek convention, but with less ears, you know? Yeah, okay, so, yeah. Um, so she said, I'm going to, I'm going to, she said, it's in Banff this year, and you're Canadian. This was like in 2000, 2001. She said, you're Canadian, so I'm going to sponsor you to go. You're going to play at this. Wow. So it's a thing that I never would have thought I would ever do. I would never have chosen it. Um, and I thought she was just trying to make a sale. Like, I thought that's just what you tell someone, you flatter them. Right, so and then they'll they, buy an oboe. Yeah. yeah. So I bought the oboe. I went home, and about three months later, she called me and said, okay, so I've cleared it, you're going, so I'll just cover your ticket, and, you know, wow. uh, we'll see you in Banff. So I put together this insane program, insane, including this 30-minute electroacoustic piece by a composer named Christos Hatzis, who, the piece was not really performed live, and I had started to perform it um, when I was in school. Really, in, a really cool piece. Um, and so with some other stuff I put on. So it was in August that year. I tortured myself. I practiced eight hours a day all summer, like for at least two, oh. two months, um, and was in pretty great shape. And I went out, um, and it was terrifying. So I step on, so I bought a pair of pants. They were plaid pants from Banana Republic. They were super cool. I didn't put them on until the day of. Oh, so shit. as I put them on and I was bending over to tie my shoes, my ass came right out the back of the pants. Like they split. Oh. And so I'm there and I, all I had, to, to wear were what my mother would call pedal pushers. So like, you know, there was popular for a little while. You'd wear those like three quarter length kind of shorts. Yeah. You know, and yeah, all, the, yeah. all the Italian guys were wearing them in Toronto and I thought it was super cool. So I, I got a pair and I just looked kind of like a nerd. So I had to go out on stage like that and oh. sandals. So, um, and I explained to the audience, I said, I'm so sorry about my, I, I mean, I mean no disrespect to my craft. I apologize. Right. It's just that I don't have any of the pants, and I told them what happened. I split my pants. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for the whole week, people would shout at me, I don't think your ass looks that sharp, you know. Um, so uh, at this concert, the sitting in the front row are is the owner of the Loray Oboe Company. Oh, wow. And his, I think his daughter, some of the most influential teachers in the country at the time, my very favorite um, uh, oboe soloist, who was based in London, in the U.K., and the room is full, okay? Because my friend, my oboe dealer, told everyone, come in here, Joey. Nobody knew who I was. There was no reason to come and see me. I was an absolute unknown. Right. Um, and I played this insane program. And this is, um, I played. So at, even if you're 
prepared, hyper prepared, the best that you can hope for in pu in public, or what's a great go thing, aim for about 80% of what you can do. If you can hit 80% of your potential in front of people, that's a successful performance. Okay. I hit about 98% of my potential wow. in front of these people. That's sweet. Okay. So um, the response was very positive. Um, Larray gave me an oboe. Oh, shit. Um, and um, and then sponsored me to do a number of concerts over the next several years. Wow, where was that? Like all, uh, like in I think I went to North Carolina, Austin. I was supposed, to, yeah. There, like there were. It was it, they. Dude. They even like paid for my pianist to come um, meet me. It it was a, it, again. This was during the whole CBC time, so I was feeling, I w I felt like a complete fraud to be honest. Oh, I, I, yeah. Okay. So I'm getting all this attention. And, um, and I did feel like a fraud and I just, and I, uh, but it's funny how you feel like a fraud, but you're spending eight hours a day practicing like a fucking professional right? and still your mind's going to tell you you're yeah. not good, Joey. Well, right. Yeah. And, but it was super stressful, but it was, I felt kind of fancy for a second, but it was really stressful. Like that, it was a very stressful period. Um, cause then I'm doing well. And then the other thing that's been really cool and now I feel like I'm talking too much, but, um, I guess that's, that's, that's the point, but it's cool. I, I'm like you have. I'm into it. Okay. Like keep telling me. I, I love this stuff. Well, the other um, really th the fortunate thing about my career is that I've come into contact with lots of composers, lots of living composers. Um, so people have written stuff to my playing, like for my playing. So um, I've been lucky enough that um, that's really cool. That's I've really had two pieces written for me by a composer, Eric Ross. One of them was a concerto that I did the world premiere in Memphis, okay. and then. There's an oboe player named Elizabeth Rahm. She's a com very, very uh, prominent female Canadian composer living who wrote me a concerto that I did with the Winnipeg, the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra. Um, and then some uh, work for piano and oboe by Beverly Lewis. She's based in Toronto. Um, and a piece by Lothar Klein. He was a, a, a professor at U of T, a composition professor. Um, and, this, and Christos Hatzis, who wrote this amazing piece that I played, I was terrified of him. Uh, we were in an elevator one day, and I asked him, before I knew of this piece, I, I asked him if he had written anything for oboe, and he said, yeah, I have this piece, but it's really, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And so I just was silent, and he, he asked me if I circular breathe, which I do, which is just I can breathe in through my nose while I keep playing on um, force. It's really uh, impressive. It's <laughs> super cool. He's so, done it a few times there, and he, he just... Yeah, so I can play for like several, like 10 minutes if I wanted to, to without stopping, if, unless my mouth got too tired, right. or more than that. So... He said, this piece that I wrote needs circular breathing. I told him I did. So he gave me this piece, and then I, that's, I started to play it. That was the piece I did at the convention. I did it f on the radio in Toronto. So then I asked him if he ever thought about writing an oboe concerto, and he said no. And then Symphony Nova Scotia asked him to, and so he made it into a co-commission. So on the piece it says, to Suzanne Lemieux and Joseph Sablaggio. Like it's which is pretty cool. Yeah, dude. You know? That's uh, so cool. I haven't had a chance to play that piece. I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to play it. The orchestral parts are so hard um okay yeah so you know i've been that like i've been super lucky like that's i work really hard but there's an element of luck like there's good fortune in there too yeah but when it's coupled with hard work i mean you're you're creating your luck at that point like to sit there and work eight hours a day and go in and hit 98 percent of how good you are in front of these people like you earned that it was you put that, the blood sweat and tears that was pretty cool um and um but then you know okay well, I mean, I'll leave there. There is a negative side to it, too, because then people have this expectation that every time I would play, it would be like that. Oh, 98%, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it just was that's not the case. Right. That's good. It's kind of refreshing to hear because when you said, like, if you hit 80, it's a good performance. I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not so bad. I'm, like, hitting 60. <laughs> I can get a bit a bit higher. But, that, dude, that's so cool, the fact that, like, you've done all this stuff. And how old were you? Like, this is all in, in your 30s when you had so. Yeah. Now, you said that you, you walked around saying, like, I'm an oboist. That was your identity. But now you've taken that step back. What's your identity now? It's about teaching the next generations? Yeah, well, so I don't, I don't teach music. So I just I use music to help kids embrace literacy, right? So I, I, I developed this, this thing that I, I, um, I've taught for the Rainbow District here in Sudbury and for the CNIB nationally. And we do it. That's an online program. Okay. Um, where I use music to uh, inspire kids to come up with story content that then we develop into a like a cogent like linear story, yeah. and then um, I, I put and actually some of the kids will create music and so there's a we make a soundtrack, the the participants record the story, and we make like a radio play or a video out of it depending, 
when you say make the music, do they hum the melodies in your... No, no, no. no. Like, I have a kid... Um, currently, the last thing I did, one of the kids um, who is partially sighted made a bunch of music using, using GarageBand. Oh, I see. Okay. One of the kids improvised on piano oh, nice. um, and just recorded stuff. And, and then I fill in on GarageBand now. I used, to, I used to do all of it on the oboe, and I would use Acapella, which is an app where you can record multiple tracks. Oh, right, okay. Um, and um, really cool, really cool It's toy. on your phone? Like, yeah. Yeah, Jordan was telling us about this. Yeah, it's super yeah, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and so some of them I'll do, I'll do multiple um, uh, tracks of oboe. Okay. Um, and but and then you you've seen the, when I do when I outfit a story with music to do live it's always with a live group of musicians and yeah. um, and we try to what I thought was really cool so we've worked together for a year and when we first started working together the librarians were terrified of what I had done for the first book so previously uh, the the musicians would play something the librarian would read right you'd know when to stop you turn the page the musicians would play something. And that was, people were really comfortable with that format. And there were some, a couple of librarians who were terrified. Um, well, I can, I understand why. So, yeah. the, well, in the, the first book, which, um, uh, Quinn. Bond, yeah, what was our first book? Quinn it was like, Sounds of the City. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Quinn had picked this book and it started with, um, just this graphic page of onomatopoeia. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I opened the book and as soon as I saw that. I was like, I'm doing it. I think I even said, I think I had the we book the for meeting. a minute. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Because as soon as I saw that I knew that it could be scored as a song, I didn't need it to be sung. I just wanted to draw to the attention of the audience, the comparison between rhythm and notes in music and um, composition, like syllables in language. Right. And so to make that, like, a, to make that connection meaningful, I just set these things to music so that I wanted it could have just been rhythm it could you could have tapped it out on a drum it would have been the same idea right. but I turned them into little songs yeah and it um, was awesome it, it was, was pretty cool oh my god dude it was that's I just I had just started and I I did that I still have the poster on my wall because I'm like <laughs> this was the coolest program I've ever done that's okay. and, cool. and the idea of like community like I'm in with a bunch of other musicians and I felt like I'm keeping up I'm like I'm reading with them yeah. and like it was so fun and the fact, go ahead, sorry, but well, I want your, to talk. Your background as a musician, like, certainly paid into that, so. I, I, I'm, in, yeah, that's why I kind of said I'll do this, because just being able to keep up and read, I was like, okay, I know we can keep that rhythm going, where I'm, where there's no weird lulls or anything, I just know, like, that's ending, I can kind of bring in my, my words or mm -hmm. whatever, tell my part of the story, and then you guys come back in, like, it was so cool, and you wrote all those parts. Yeah, so, um, mainly what I do is I, um, so I did what? Two books, and then we did that uh, a movie program at the end. Uh, yeah, the movie. Uh, yeah, we did. We did. Music. Yeah, we did the um, Sons of the City, Rock Paper Scissors. Yeah, and then we did the movie music. Yeah. So what I typically do is I I just um I re read a story. So with the onomatopoeia, I composed the music that accompanied that, obviously, and then but like for the other the other music, much of it would would be like popular music from the classical canon like I you like to use some things people recognize but also some obscure things to make it fun for musicians I want to write challenging things so that we have to work right because right, um, right. I think that for a, for a kid to see a really committed performer it, then it just it's more it's just more impactful somehow you know it's, I see people people who perform for kids and they're like oh whatever I don't want to do this and I love playing for kids any every audience deserves the same kind of respect and the same quality material which is why I started designing these things because nobody had meaningful material for me to play for kids so I just did it myself for rock paper scissors so I came up with I composed the battle theme um, so the battle themes for rock paper and scissors are all original compositions that I wrote and then when um, so when they battle um, someone or a character in the story you hear their theme then when they battled each other I would take, I would splice the themes together. Oh, nice. Um, so I, if rock were paper, were doing paper, then I'd have I'd begin with the rock theme and then end with the paper theme and kind of make it work somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, those were fun programs to do. Dude, the, 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 like, I want to go into composition because, like, we talked about your, your career as a noble player, as a noble voice, but, like, when did you start composing? Because it was great stuff, man. It was, <laughs> it was so fun. Like, I, I, yeah, it was very impressive. Um, I, okay, well, this is, I don't know. Do you have a like any any um, music notation software? Do you have anything? I I, I know about Audacity. Is that one? I know That's like more editing. Okay. I know GarageBand had it. There was okay. another element where you can go in. If you, because you have a music background, um, this is um, there's a fantastic free software called Muse Score. M U S E 
S C O R E. Okay. Um, it's constantly updating. I want to say it's Canadian, but I just want it to be Canadian, so I'm not sure. Right, okay. Um, it's a free download. It's super easy to use. Mm, it's a notation software, so you input note notes. Um, you can have as many instruments as you want. You can have a whole score. You and then and there's a playback, so you can hear how it sounds. So I've been looking for something free because there are things that are very expensive that you can buy. Um, and I was, I was cheap. And especially when I was beginning this business, I wanted to start with a zero cost model. I wanted to show people that you can find effective free things on the internet, that the only thing you really, the only essential that you need is time and creative capital. Right. And so everything I used when I first started was free and much of what I use now is free. Did you start in Memphis? You were doing yeah. this in Memphis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just wanted, I started to just like find cool bits from orchestra pieces that I thought I could reduce down to like three or four voices. Right. So I would do that. And then, um, and then I started do, using it for these, these education programs that I started getting commissions from other orchestras to write shows for them. I would use that program. And then one day I was just sitting down and I thought, well, just try to write something. So I gave myself like this ridiculously small parameter. I thought, well, write a theme and variations on row, row, row your boat. Okay. So I just, you know, put down a bunch of things. I didn't know. Um, and it, sound like music. It turns out that by virtue of having sat down in an orchestra for as long as I have, like I paid virtually no attention to, like in, in school about any theoretical aspect of music. So this is not based on training. It's more, it comes more if I'm inspired. Right. So I wrote this thing and it was really cool. It was way out there. And then I was making a beer run to the CVS there in Memphis. And I thought, I'm going to write a minor, it's like a sad uh, variation. And of in that my, same row, row, your yeah. row, okay. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm walking, and I, I started kind of hum, like singing in my head, and I came home and I wrote it down exactly as it was in my head. I didn't, I didn't change a single note, um, and it's solid. Um, and so I wrote a series of about. Oh, I keep hitting this. That's okay. I wrote a series of about five variations, like a theme, and maybe four or five variations, and I was so. I used to go and study with the woman who used to play second in Detroit, like well into my into my career, because she would just help me kind of. At the end of a season, she would just kind of screw my head off and screw it back on straight. We'd make a bunch of reads, we'd play together. Really amazing person Sweet. and great teacher, um, Shelley Heron. Um, she teaches at Western now, and um, so I was there one time and I said, "Oh, hey, look at this funny thing I wrote." And I had my computer and she said, "Oh, can I have the music to that?" So like, yeah, okay, sure. So you could just print it off and you score. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'm in Oregon. I'm at a gig one time and I'm just scrolling through Facebook and the principal in Detroit was retiring and they were having like a little party concert for him hosted by the oboe section. And it said on the bottom music by Beethoven and Sal Villaggio. And I thought it was so hilarious. So yeah. they play this, like, so it's been played, like, you know, um, I've played it at, at, at the Double Reconvention and it's, I, we, it's been played a couple times and it's That's pretty sweet. cool. Yeah. Right? So do you get like, do you, you really, you get off on composing or is that something you just, it's a means to an end kind of no, thing? No, I love it. Okay. To, to yeah. sit down and to, to, to sit down and do something or sit down and there was not a thing there before right. and you leave and there's a thing, a new thing that you made. Yeah. Like. Um, I write birthday songs for all of my closest friends, nice. um, and because how often does someone write a song for you? Yeah, that's cool. Um, I always write them. I'm a terrible singer, so I write them with like big leaps that I can't make, just because it's stupider, you know. Right, right. Um, and then I just write like a joke that like all of our like little jokes inside of a song. And but it's 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 actually a really cool um, exercise to write down, just to sit down and play with some chords. Do you write music? Oh yeah, I do. Okay, that's yeah. all I do. Cool. That's like my number one thing. But I don't, I, I'm not classically trained. I'm like, I, I grew up playing guitar in garages. You know what I mean? Like I never. But I wasn't trained. I virtually, okay. If you're assuming that to compose, you have to study composition or you have to know theory. I am proof that you don't have to. Right. Um, because I, like I said, dude, I did not pay attention in school. Yeah. You... Um, I, my only interest was I wanted to play the oboe. The oboe was fun and it made me feel like I, like there was meaning, like meaning. I found meaning in like playing. That was your purpose. I didn't care about yeah. any of the, in the rest of it. The rest of it, I, what I did, I did begrudgingly, which now I realize I'd be in a better place had I not been that like that. But all that to say, I can sit down and pretty much write 
music. Well, you've heard. I mean, I can pretty yeah. much write music. Yeah, and it's um, good. It's so like it, it's it's. It's awesome. But I mean, uh, but I'm sure that what you're doing is also wicked because like you don't have to know. You just have to have a good, you have to have a sense of taste about how you're going to just put your chords together. Yeah. And then there's a feeling. I, I'm more of like, like, I don't, you're probably like this too, but when you get that feeling, you're like, that feels right. Yeah. You know, there's like this internal filter mm -hmm. that we kind of write through and yeah. Yeah, I get all my jollies from writing. I like I could, I prefer writing over playing. So do you like just take? Do you put down chords? Like do you write them down? Uh, I I'll write with guitar. I'll and yeah. I'll just remember it and then I'll obsess over that progression <laughs> and then I'll build on it. I'll put a drum beat in. I'll put a bass line. I'll, you know where am I? What feeling do I want? That's cool. kind of how. Yeah, so cool. I'll write full songs. Um, but it's it's like with lyrics and stuff like that too. And you write the lyrics as well. Yeah. Is that that's hard? I find. It, it's getting e like once you find your process you know it, it kind of gets easier but yeah it, it's difficult but again there's this internal filter where i'm like those don't work those words aren't right mm -hmm. and then some other words will come through and i'm like you know this kind of got through the filter i think this is good so i just kind of got to trust my process but i think you you could probably relate like you like when you have a way of doing it you kind of learn this works best and you mm -hmm. stick to that way but then you get caught in the trap of like maybe it's going to sound the same as the other stuff that right, I've written, right, you know right. what i mean so are you looking to write more like the way you have been um yeah like i so when i was in memphis i started writing a kids ballet okay. um that so it was not just for kids it was it was going to be a ballet um based on a superhero so i used to play this superhero video game called city of heroes okay. and the very first character i made i thought it was a funny name i called her ladybug lady and so I incorporated that character into, into a kid's show that I did. And then I thought, huh, I'm going to turn this into a full-on kid's ballet. So the concept was a, a, like a company of child dancers, three actors and three adult dancers, and they would play the main roles. And so one, the actor would actually deliver the story, but there would be this ballet aspect. So I've written about 50% of the music that I think I would need for that. Um, and, I, and much of it is, is actually, I think pretty solid i've read a lot of it with musicians who have been and pretty, the, the, they've been pretty positive about it um and so who knows if that'll happen you know i have so i have a hundred million things going on in my brain at any given time and a million projects and so i'm getting known now in sudbury as the guy who's too busy to bill you because i'm just too busy doing the work oh that's not a good thing you know what you well, know. No, but it pisses people off because people have like fiscal schedules they have to keep to and so i get myself in trouble occasionally oh wow yeah because i'm like well you know you're supposed to give me an invoice and uh we have to get rid of this money so you better go ahead and do it yeah 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 you're like well i just love doing this and that's the thing yeah. i mean i do need to actually live but right. but you know but it is you know the thing too and i think you can tell this from the library stuff like it's i do Here's a thing I struggle with, and I don't know if you can give me some advice. Yeah. I do a lot of work on when I do a, a thing. I, I do as much work as what is necessary. I'm not necessarily doing the work that I'm being paid for. It's always going to be more work than what I'm being paid. Right. But I don't know how to not do that much work because it needs to be done because the quality has to be such that it's something I'm proud of. Yeah. How does one seek commensurate pay? Is it possible to be that detail-oriented and get paid for it? That's a good question. I don't think it is. I don't think it is because, yeah, it's tough because is there, there's no money in the arts. Right. So the money they're giving you, you're like, oh, wow, okay, I'll, yeah, that's good. I'll take that. 500 bucks, that works. Right. But like you say, yeah, the, the if you want something really good, yeah, you're going to have to, I, either you pay me more or I'm going to have to give my, my own time. Yeah. But then you get a personal feeling of, mm -hmm. you know, out of it. Well, I can't put something on stage that I don't think is qual is a quality product. I can't right. do it. Um, there and there is like a personal gratification that you get, um, and seeing how it, like the impact is amazing. Like the kids, like I have, like we have fans now at the library. Yeah. Like I have kids who come to the library. They your posters and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, is, are we going to see Joey at the library? Um, that's sweet. <clears throat> and that's amazing. Um, I think part of it too maybe is just you have to hustle. Like, yeah. The the thing too is one other thing I think. As long as one is committed to quality, you're always going to get another contract. So it's not like I'm, I'm always going to work. Right. I may not be able to use that as my always my primary source of revenue. But if you do that work, that kind of work, you get hired again. Well, it, you're proof. Look at all this stuff that one thing led you to the next. And yeah. Like, yeah. And like, have you ever had to get a normal, not a job that's not musician? Yeah. You have? Yeah. Well, only recently. Okay. Like, okay. So 
I love talking about this. So when I was 16, I worked at Baskin Robbins for like six months and I got fired. Okay. Um, and then I did then I never had another job except for music until I moved back here. So when COVID happened, all my teaching shut down. I was teaching for the Canadian Opera Company in Toronto once a day. And then I was teaching for the Rainbow District a couple of days a week. Okay. <clears throat> and it was enough for me, you know? Right, right. And then when COVID happened, all of that went away. Um, everything. And I didn't have any work. Yeah. So um, at that time, the Bed Bath & Beyond in Sudbury was opening. Right. So I, well, I go in there with, and I with a, I, r- like wrote a resume. I'd never had a non-music resume. And I walked in and... Um, what was on it? Baskin Robbins? <laughs> no, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. not, I mean, I put down... Okay, I had worked for like a cleaning company. Like I was helping out right, right, with right. a cleaning company. So I put that down. And, yeah. um, so I just walked in and I said, you know, I'm a life... I'm a career uh, musician and educator. And outside of that, I have no other life skills. She was like, you're hired. Wow. And then, and then within three years, I was one of the assistant managers. Really? Yeah, I loved that job. I will maintain that. So that was when I kind of put the oboe down. Okay. And so I was doing this other job that made me feel great. And like I was learning things and accomplishing things without any of the stress or the angst involved with the oboe. Right. And I met like a, some really great friends there. Um, I discovered that I'm, I love providing customer service. I had people who used to come just to smoke with me. No shit. They wouldn't even, sh- they would just come in just to visit. Like, wow. um, and it was, um, very, it was a really, it was maybe one of the most, um, transformative, transformative experiences of my adult life. Really? Yeah. I, I, wow. I loved it. Um, and so <clears throat> I, um, um, I was still playing a little bit then and I was teaching so there would be weeks where I would have to do a full-time shift and then do a rehearsal or a concert or you know, it was I can I can do two things well at once right. but three things is too many okay um and so that was tough at the end so you had to give up no they closed bed bath closed oh geez okay yeah. so that was an easy yeah it was easy but I, lo- I love that job That's I it was so fun and like Okay, I know we're going a little long, but one of my major philosophies in life, so you can't win music, right? right if people yeah. use, oh, I won that audition, whatever. Then there's something, there's another audition you're not going to win. So every day I try to win something small. So like um, if I'm standing in line at the bank and everyone's like looking at their watch and they're being all weird, I just stand really still and really calm. I'll be the calmest one here. And I win standing in line. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I had... Um, I had a back surgery, and at, at, you know, for the MRI, they tell you, lie really still, monitor your breathing, otherwise we won't get proper imaging. Right. So I did that, I did what I was told, they take me out of the machine, and the nurse said, I just have to tell you, you were, ex- you were exceptionally still. And I said, I'm sorry, what? She said, um, yeah, you were really still. I said, no, what was the word you used? She said, oh. exceptionally. I was like, I won being still. Yeah. So... <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, so it's and, cool though. It's a victory. Why not? Yeah, and yeah. so I feel like um, at Bed Bath and Beyond, um, that sort of attitude that I had, every if I was performing the same task as someone, especially before I was on management, everyone knew it was a contest. Everyone knew I was racing them, and it okay. it, it, it improved productivity. I probably could not have instilled that from the level the management level down. Right. I think that doing it from how I did it, but it but it persisted. It increased productivity in the store. And it um, wasn't done in a malicious way. No. It was a personal. It was a fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. it was a fun, let's beat our own best. And so, our own best time. And, um, but so, again, transferable skills. Like, yeah. you know, I didn't think I had any, any other life skills. And it turns out that what I've learned from music completely informs how I do everything. So, now when you ask me, why do I think, who, who am I now? What do I think of myself? What is my identity? Yeah. Just a pretty good guy. And that's, and, and that's, I think that's a great thing to be because you're like, I can, yeah. Yeah. Like get along with everyone. I'm well, good not, to people. Not everyone. Well, you're good to people and you're yeah, good to I yourself try. and I you, try. you know, but you, it's, Oh, you go, no, you go ahead. I go ahead. Well, it's just, I was going to just say, um, let me see if I can remember what I was going to say. Weird that's why I say go ahead. Cause I forgot to, <laughs> <laughs> um, I win at forgetting. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, um, yeah, so we're talking about winning things and... And like your identity skills. and being a good guy. Oh, yeah. Well, and so just being a good guy. I thought... I was so terrified to get a job outside of my field. Many musicians, I think, feel the same way, which is why people stay in jobs, because it's so hard to get a job in music. If you get one, hang on for dear life, because you right. may not get another one. Right. <clears throat> but what I realized 
was um, I did a job my whole life that I felt deeply had meaning. Um, I want my my whole goal was to speak through this instrument. So I was terrified to get another job because I thought, what will have as much meaning? Nothing could have that meaning for right, me. Right, right, right. But what it turns out is that I actually bring meaning to the jobs I do. And I think I learned that from you. But like, if you had told me 10 years ago that you would be talking, raving about your experience of, of working in retail, a thing you'd never done, right. I, would not, I, wouldn't, I would not believe you. I would scoff. But what I found was at Bed Bath & Beyond, and actually in my current position, um, what I th what the, it's so meaningful for me to be able to actually impact someone's day. People come in to a, an environment like that, especially where I am now, and they have a struggle. A lot of the time, if they have to fax something or whatever, they're not, they're not doing it because it's fun. There's, they're, they're troubled. Right, they, right. There's something happening. Um, and for me to be able to make that, to facilitate that process and to make that easier and to show some humanity, you can't even believe the dividends. Yeah. The, that the path from that is amazing. And so, again, like I said, I feel like I am at a point now where I do think of myself as a pretty good guy. I mean, I'm trying to get better. Well, yeah, but, that's, I think that's a good thing. We're all trying to, right. you know, yeah. But I think that what I've come to understand is that, um, yeah, we, at the risk of sounding cliche, um, you, I think we, we bring meaning to what we do. And yeah. that is, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's how I want to spend my life. So whether it's teaching, playing, whatever I'm doing. Giving, me, be, giving, yeah, yeah. I want it to be intentional. I want it to be impactful. Do you think the person who hired you at Bed Bath & Beyond saw that yeah. when you said, I, I got nothing <laughs> since yeah, she, I play Oval? She, she actually handpicked me to work with her in the warehouse because she said, if he's a musician, musicians get shit done. Okay. That's, yeah. that's good. I'm glad that's a good uh, thing that people think about us yeah. because, you know, a lot of times a musician, they're alcoholics or doing drugs, right. you know. So there's more than just that, kids. Musicians <laughs> get things done. Exactly. That's cool, man. That. Thank you so much for chatting. I, I, well, I guess we could leave it there for now, but yeah, yeah. I just, I think like, just thinking back to everything you've said, like there's this, this connection that um, I feel like you, maybe you were looking for and you received through your music and through your, pro, your, your, your journey, I guess. And like, it's, it's been great getting to know you. It's been great hearing your story, man. And just being Thanks. able to connect with you on this level yeah, too. Yeah. And yeah, thank you, dude. Cool. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Anytime you want to come back and chat, and maybe we'll play some oboe. And actually, I did have a question. Okay. Really quick. Um, Eric. Yeah. I, was, I was picking you from the class. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was curious if I ever wanted to do um, so, like write music, but then write it for someone that, such as yourself to come in and read. Like, have you done studio work? Like, is that something you're? Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I don't love it. I, I do. I've recorded a bunch of. I recently recorded some stuff on um, a Steph Paquette. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Album. Um, love that guy. He's amazing. Yeah, he's um, cool. And um, the the thing is, so with the oboe, the oboe has some production sound that comes. Um, if you, I mean, I have some production sound. The recorded sound is always weird for me to hear. Okay. Like um, I hopefully like I have I have some music that I'm gonna drop by you guys so you can maybe incorporate it in this. This is done in like it's one of the only recordings I have that I kind of like. It's a completely controlled studio environment it was i had a producer i we right. got a hall like a really lovely hall to do it in um so the oboe my oboe my oboe sound is poorly recorded unless it's like kind of in a place but there's like you can always like dock, if you're willing to like doctor something up a little bit slap on a bunch of reverb you know yeah yeah you know yeah, we can... that's what i was getting like i would imagine that that instrument is you it, it's supposed to be played in like you said a hall right so it should have this 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 reverb, this natural reverb that you're expecting to get the right, room, yeah. yeah, right. So to record it in some somewhere like this, where the, the sound's dead, there's no echo. It would just be like blank. Yeah, right there. Yeah, it's it, the room exactly. you're in almost is a part of the instrument, yeah. I guess. Well, it almost be, yeah. yeah. You know, well that's that's why. Like, so in Thunder Bay, they have a gorgeous hall. Um, Memphis had a very nice hall, um, and in a in a in a finely tuned hall, like when acousticians finely tune a space like that. Yeah. So in Memphis, I could play, and I, I, there were times where I could kind of spin the sand in a certain way, and I could almost feel it like hitting the very back. Like you could just feel it carry. Right. Um, 
And it was, that is a remarkable, that's a remarkable thing to hear. And just because the way it was the treated acoustically. Yeah. That's interesting. I'd love to, like, I'd love to record, I don't, like, could I, how do you get in touch with the symphony and say, hey, I want, I have a part for uh, a trumpet player, I have a part for a noble player. Like, how would I do something like that? I don't, well, musicians here are super friendly. And a lot of the time, um, like, if you, if you needed to contact us, like, a, a, some instrumentalist, I mean, I can clearly, I could totally point you in the direction Sweet. of where you'd, where you'd want to go. I bet you that all you'd have to do is say, hey, do you want to come in and just read a piece that I wrote? And I'll bet you about 85%, 90% of the time people are going to say, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And because I'm looking for a grant as well. We had talked about that. And I'd love to hire musicians in the community to come be part of the album. Like, how you know, I want a mm -hmm. guitar player for this part or whatever. Yeah, play. yeah. But yeah, okay, cool. That's good to know because it's the, the symphony is something that, like, I grew up in the valley. I didn't know we had a symphony until I was like, into my 20s like mm -hmm. i just knew that music was for, for people that wasn't me and i play guitar poorly and i should stay in my <laughs> lane but now like i started teaching and i taught like all the like trumpet and i didn't teach oboe that's for sure i stayed away but clarinet and stuff like that yeah and it opened my eyes to like there's so much more to music than what we think you know we listen to our four chord songs we listen to blink 182 right. as kids music is so much more than that and i'm like i'm so grateful at what you guys do you're bringing a different element of music to the community and I, I feel like we need more of it and that's why when you came to the library and played for all these kids it's like these kids are going to get a an image that they're maybe not getting at home of what it could be well right and if i go and i play like the mario brothers theme yeah. all that that says oh i want to pick up an instrument because there are certain things i'd like to play too yeah you know um it's and well that's the thing about working with kids that's so incredible is that you're you're planting a seed like when i first started teaching online and i'll be i'll be brief but when I first started teaching online, when I would land a class, I would say to the kids, so, you know, I do exist outside of the computer. If you should see me in public, I'm going to need you to scream, Mr. Joey, hi, Mr. Joey. And yeah. I said, I'll apologize to your adult or whoever you're with. <laughs> but this is, I'm asking you, it's only happened twice, maybe once or twice. Um, and I have had to apologize to an angry adult both times. But um, it's it's funny, like this this whole thing with um, that I'm doing with the CNIB, um, the very first time I did it, the first piece of feedback I got, because part of what I'm doing is using music with narrative, but I talk a lot about how music is used in movies and commercials and video games and what the impact, what that does to drive the mood, right? Right, right. So this one young, maybe seven years old, um, uh, a person who I believe was completely blind, um, they would have, they had a family movie night, and one week after, like a couple weeks after I finished up my program, she asked her mom to pause the movie to ask her why did they think they used that music. Wow, that impact. Like that is yeah. like so to know to know that that the work I'm doing now with kids is is having this impact. Like and it, these kids are not going to forget this kind of experience. No. You know, and and frankly they should be getting more arts-based experiences and it's just tough to find. So um yeah, it, it's I'm just I'm really psyched about what I'm doing now. It's a, it's a it is having kind of decided to put down full time professional playing. This is the best way for me to move forward towards something that's really gratifying Good. and makes me so happy and can actually be improve the life, like the life of somebody else. Yeah, that's so cool, man. And they need it. These kids need it to, and like that would blow my mind too. The fact that like when we watch movies, even even as adults, I know there's music, but it's not the first thing I'm thinking about. Right. But to have that kid who's seven years old to stop and say like, hey, man, like let's play that back. Why do you think? Mm -hmm. Just to have that thought is so cool, man. You're doing yeah. really great things. Well, I hope I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm to. trying to. Yeah, man. Thank you so much, Joy. Sure. And come back and talk to us once you get yourself set up with this new grant with what your your next goals are. Come yeah. back and talk to us if you want to, to awesome. tell us more, man. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, dude. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Joey. Welcome to our sound. 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 And so this is a very different guy.